Africa is a young continent. With the majority of its population being under 35 years old, there is no better way than to conclude the first day of the next Einstein Global Gathering with our next topic. I would like to invite the following two people who will be leading the session, this very special session titled Inspiring the Next Generation, an intergenerational conversation between top t scientists. I would like to call upon Mr. Travis, managing, managing editor for News of Science, who's going to be the moderator for the next session. Mr. Travis, please take a seat. To open this session, I would like to invite our keynote speaker, Dr. Vladimir Susha, Director General of the Joint Research Center at the European Commission. Dr. Vladimir, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, um, distinguished panelists, um, let me be at the beginning of the session a little bit more personal. Actually, I've never been in my speeches and, and introductions uh, uh, personal before. At the age of uh, 15, I was banned from uh, studying at uh, secondary school uh, for political reasons. And it, and it took uh, two years for me to enter and start my secondary education. The same was repeated <clears throat> when I was entering university. It was uh, almost impossible, but then finally it happened. And the same was when I was starting my PhD, I had to get the derogation from the Communist Party in my, carti in my country to, to do it. I got a fantastic topic for my PhD. I got shared office and I got 60 to 70 euro per month fellowship, um, which was uh, lower than minimum salary in my country, but it was possible to survive. And that's, that was it. I didn't have a lab, and we had to, had to establish the lab in the, in the abandoned storage. We got some recycled and, and spare uh, dishes uh, in, from the labora of the laboratories from our colleagues uh, who were able to share this with us. And uh, we started with also with my colleagues to reach out. And we reach out to, to many good people uh, around the world. They helped us. We asked for reprints, for their knowledge, for some chemicals, for samples, uh, for collaboration. And it was absolutely great that we were able to do our research in spite of the fact that our conditions were below uh, something what one would call poor. In the meantime, we defeated communism in my country and many more opportunities opened. And I was uh, actually appointed as the youngest professor in my country. And soon after, I was ranked by um, academic rating agency as a top-notch scientist in my field. Why I'm saying all of this, I, please don't take me wrongly, I'm not advocating for putting young people into difficulties when they start. On contrary, I have been doing all my best to change this and to, to avoid that anybody else is treated in this way. But if for whatever reasons on the earth you may encounter this, uh, this kind of difficulties, this kind of uh, element, in your life, please remember that uh, material conditions are not the most important. They are important, but they are not going to make the difference. They are not going to make you successful. Everything is here and everything is here. So by combination of your mind and of your heart, you can achieve whatever you want to achieve in your life in spite of all difficulties you may encounter in, on, on this way. And actually, I must say that my microcosmos of research, laboratory research, was one of the most fascinating activities 
I have ever done in my life. And I can compare it only with the climbing uh, the highest mountains uh, uh, in, on, on, on this planet or discovering the universe where you are discovering in your own field things which have never been discovered by uh, other people. It depends, uh, it can be very small step forward which brings the global knowledge one micro step uh, uh, ahead or it can be huge uh, uh, advancement like we will be witnesses with the Nobel Prize laureate in a, in a few, few minutes. And then I, I was um, somehow interested more in my life in direct impact of, of the knowledge of my research. So then I started to work um, a little bit more with industry. I started to work uh, a little bit more with society because I wanted to see my knowledge applied in, 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 the, uh, in, in a society. And it brought me where I am now, at the head of a big research institute with more than 3,000 scientists and uh, engineers inside the European Commission, where we are trying uh, to bring science at the crossroad of science, research, society, and politics. This is where we are operating, and uh, we are asking ourselves uh, very important questions which are of multidisciplinary, of multidisciplinary uh, uh, character. We are looking at the big trends in the society. We are trying to use the science from different, uh, uh, different corners of uh, different scientific knowledge to tackle big issues. But also issues like how the traditional knowledge producing organizations are going to survive something what we call a post-fact society. Is it true that we don't need experts anymore as we hear from many politicians right now? How we are going to tackle this issue? How we are going to survive? Is the knowledge organizations, are the knowledge organization in a destiny to die out or to be transformed into something which we don't want them to be transformed in. How we are going to overcome the tsunami of data, information and knowledge in which we are drowning in. How we are going to start for wisdom, how this wisdom is going to be managed. How we are going to build this knowledge on the shoulders of the others. How we are going to build the communities of knowledge to overcome this ocean of knowledge which is around us to prevent the drowning inside, inside the knowledge. How we are going to reinvent education. Remember, we are in a full speed entering the fourth industrial revolution and every industrial revolution revolutionized education before but we still don't know what is going to be next education, what is going to be the most important feature of the education of the future. How we are going to reinvent our petrified policies and policy-making processes. Is science able to enlighten uh, people responsible for decisions? So this is another question which we are uh, asking ourselves. So then, if you are interested in joining us on this road towards uh, putting science at the heart of policy, at the heart of politics, at the heart of decision making, please, I'm here for creating the partnerships. And creating the partnerships with Africa, we will be demonstrating tomorrow at five o'clock in our special side event, which is focused on how science can help decision making and policy making in Africa, in particularly by launching our knowledge source uh, for Africa, with Africa for, for the future. So then uh, let me finish by this invitation uh, collaboration with, uh, with my organization, but also with the organization uh, uh, in Europe, in the European Union and worldwide, because I'm sure that every, every, as I witnessed this in my life, when we had been in difficulties, there were always fantastic people around us to help us out. I'm absolutely sure that there are on this globe thousands and thousands of fantastic uh, researchers, scientists, who are able and willing to do so also for Africa and with African partners. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Sucha.
I'd like to now welcome to the stage our guests. Um, first up, uh, Dr. Klaus von Klitzing, uh, our Nobel laureate and the director of the Max Planck Institute of Solid State Science. And a, a, a familiar face already uh, at this conference, Professor Neil Turek, director of the Perimeter Institute and founder of Ames and Dr. Wilfred uh, Nifdian, um, an NF, NEF fellow and uh, director of Ames Research. <laughs> and Professor Maha Nasser, uh, another NEF fellow, pharmaceutical researcher for drug, drug carrier delivery. So unfortunately, one of our panelists, uh, Samaya Nasanki, was ill and uh, couldn't travel. She's still hoping to make it to the rest of the conference, perhaps arriving tomorrow. Um, and that's a shame because um, what she worked on uh, is gravitational waves. And if we're talking about inspiration, um, I think that uh, the discovery of gravitational waves may have been one of the most inspiring uh, events over the last two years. Uh, it resonated um, not just in the scientific community, but in the general public. Uh, some of the stories we wrote at Science were our most read ever. The videos that we produced um, about gravitational waves uh, received stunning viewership and it was a celebration of kind of the wonder of the world. So even though our LIGO researcher isn't here, we are fortunate that Neil had some uh, foresight and uh, set up a video with uh, Rainier Weiss, uh, one of the Nobel uh, originators of the LIGO concept, I guess, and uh, helped bring it to fruition. And before I start the video or ask for it to be started, I just wanted to mention that one of the first features I ever, ever did, I think it was about 25 years ago, uh, was headline LIGO, a $250 million gamble. <laughs> and it was at that time that people were telling uh, people like Ray Weiss and the rest of the founders that LIGO would not work, that it was crazy to be trying to set up this system. And I think we've proven that that was a very good gamble. And it reminds me of, as everyone's putting out a quote today, um, Einstein once said, only those who attempt the absurd can achieve the impossible. And so hopefully we can hear a little bit about uh, the impossible from Ray Weiss. I'm Ray Weiss. I happen to be at MIT right now and in the little room that I use for building things to take to the sites, uh, the LIGO sites where we do our research. I have this project that got known around the world as the thing that detected gravitational waves. Um, and that project got me to come to the Perimeter Institute. And in the process, I also got to know Neil, which was an eye-opener for both of us because it turns out that Neil and I although quite different people, he's a theorist and I'm an experimenter, had in our earlier histories very similar backgrounds. We had parents who were activists and people with social conscience and it turns out a lot of the things he told me about I could relate to in my own life. Now one of the things he told me about uh, is really was amazing to me uh, since he was brought up in South Africa he told me about a project that he is sort of responsible for. And I gather is this, it's, it's related to this book. And it's, in fact, the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, which is in South Africa. It's something that was started and had some really remarkably inventive and clever ideas. And it has several components which are important. And I, I mean, I found absolutely critical. And one of them was that you train people that, who are mathematically interested, but also who have curiosity and inventiveness. And you train them, but you don't train them like you would in a straight college course. Uh, you train them because you have both the problems unfolded slowly, you have mentorship, 
and you have conviviality between the people so that trust is built up and people become more confident in themselves. So I thought it was an absolutely wonderful layout of the way the curriculum of this thing was designed. What's being done by this Ames Center is certainly part of the ingredient. You need some benevolence and some respect for, for individuals. And one way to do it, I think, is actually to let people see how, how elegant it is to solve problems. Look at this project, the Ames Project. It's an enormously successful project. It's building something that's specific to the needs of Africa. And, and, and I think because it's picked the right set of problems, it has mentorship, it has projects, it has also the, the, the requirement effectively of becoming proselytized to the rest of the society. It's going to try to do good for the whole continent. All of those steps are essential for this to succeed, and I think they're going to succeed beautifully. The AIM Center says, look, we would like to, to, to see if there's an Einstein in, in Africa. But the right way to say it is, could one create conditions in Africa so that if there was an Einstein, you would be able to identify such a person? And what's so special about Einstein is that he was a very unique scientist, and there's absolutely no reason there shouldn't be an Einstein running around Africa. Because he was an intuitive scientist. To him, I know people celebrate his brilliance as a mathematician, and I don't think that's really his big strong point. I'm mean, sure he was good at math, but he wasn't exceptional at math. What he really was good at was being curious and inventive and his, had his own way of looking at the world. And one of the things that really was important for him and people who follow him in science was the way he developed intuition about things. And the intuition was absolutely marvelous. That's the thing that was so special about, about, about Einstein. This is a very unconventional person with his unconventional way of looking at things is actually a good model for when you are looking and trying to something groundbreaking. I strongly wish this institute, uh, the AIMS, uh, has a huge future uh, because I think they're on the right track. And what this center is doing, it's going to make a huge change in the way Africa will go forward. <laughs>
the sun and moon, I think 10,000 years ago, there was the most fascinating physical phenomenon. But uh, we know today a lot of physics, how the moon moves on the sky. So don't believe to 90%, you personally, you have the future in your hand, not the stars and the moon. So this was the sudden finding in this night. And uh, the final result was I discovered a fundamental constant, uh, something which is given by nature. And I'm lucky that only two persons in the world have their own fundamental constant, so the von Klitzing constant, uh, I have it. And okay, that's enough for me to have <laughs> forever such a constant. Uh, and finally, the final result is some electrical resistance which is given just by nature. So we cannot change it. Like the velocity of light plays a very important role in physics. It's independent of all kinds of parameters. And I saw something very fundamental. So I was starting with the silicon field effect transistor, discovered something very fundamental. And next year, you will see in the literature or in the newspaper, a new kilogram will be introduced next year. You will not feel it. The kilogram will remain the kilogram. But the kilogram will be based on natural constant, on fundamental constant, because we believe fundamental constant is the most fundamental thing we have in nature. And my discovery this, uh, started this development, so we will have a new basis of our measuring system. And this will be something unexpected. And this happens always that in science, the unexpected things are the breakthroughs. Thank you very much. Um, Neil, um, as a mathematical physicist, you've spent much of your career exploring um, what happened in the early universe, or what may have happened, the various possibilities. How did you find that as a passion? What, what drew that to you? Was it a person? Was it some reading? And how do you sustain passion for a topic over the years, particularly with a lot of frustration, as, as we talked about earlier? Yeah, I didn't want to study it initially. I wanted to do biology. <laughs> <laughs> I still think the most fascinating uh, uh, things in nature are living things. And uh, I love mathematics. And so initially, I wanted to do mathematical biology and so understand living things and try to predict what they would do. And then I guess at university I discovered they're rather complicated. <laughs> and uh, it's not actually possible to predict even what a bacteria will do. And so uh, on the contrary, in physics, uh, what grabbed my attention is you could calculate things from first principles, from basic assumptions, very basic assumptions. You could calculate things that proved to be correct to many decimal places, sometimes one part in a trillion. And to me, this is very spooky and strange that our primitive minds can understand nature at such a deep level. And once I was on that track, of course, uh, it led towards cosmology because there's nothing stranger in physics than understanding the whole universe. Um, we don't know why it works, but it does. I mean, Einstein discovered his equation. He wasn't aware this equation would describe the universe. He was simply trying to describe gravity uh, on Earth and in the solar system. He had no ambition of describing the universe in the early days. He just wanted a consistent picture of gravity, of the force of gravity. And um, so that, again, is very spooky that these equations not only describe the universe, but they predict phenomena which were unimagined, black holes. And not just predict, but they describe this with exquisite precision. So for me, it's t the fact we can do things like this with science is an important insight into who we are. We still don't know who we are, but we know we have some extraordinary capabilities. And not just it tells us who we are, but it tells us what we might do. It gives me a profound sense of optimism. Because if we could do that, then all of the everyday problems like politics and economics and uh, you know, um, all the crises the planet faces should surely be solvable. And I would hope that 
ordinary people, when they understand um, discoveries in science, would realize this is what awaits all of us, humankind, if only we can keep ourselves together, look after ourselves, look after the planet, uh, be rational, um, unimaginable things are possible. Thank you. I'm <laughs> Your colleague next door to you, uh, Wilfred, though, in some ways perhaps then pursued what you were thinking about in that he's taken mathematics yes. Yes. to the biological sciences. And that's a very unusual still, I think, uh, career choice um, to, per to follow that type of interdisciplinary path. And I'm wondering, has that been a more difficult path to take because you've had to combine two separate fields? And what motivated you to do that? Um, was it a particular class, a person, or just a problem that nagged at you throughout your life? So actually, I started out not wanting to do biology because I found it complicated. Um, uh, so in uh, secondary school, I had a great math teacher, and so math became the simplest subject for me. Mm. High school, the same. So when I went to the university, I chose to do the simplest of the subjects, which was math. I, so I, I majored in mathematics, and why not in physics? Uh, but then I had, there were real problems that I really, was interested in solving mostly health-related problems. And so I was uh, in university in Cameroon. I decided to leave, and I got a scholarship and went to the US with the goal of studying medicine. Yeah. So in the US, you have to do pre-med, and then you write the MCAT, and then you go and do med, uh, medicine. So during the pre-med, I, I started thinking, well, is this really what I want to do? I, at the time, I got exposed to scientific research, so we conduct, I was conducting experiments in the lab, and sometimes you take a, a test tube, you, measure, you want to measure what's inside, you get an output, but that output is not really what's inside the test tube. Okay, so there are certain unseen aspects of nature that determine what you see, and so you need to, to think to what, what is the mapping between what you don't see and what you see. And in, in biology, people don't want to think about these complicated things, so often the outputs are interpreted in an intuitive manner. So I saw the potential for mathematics because you can't understand this mapping without mathematics. In cases when the mapping from what is not seen and what you see is linear, sometimes you can intuitively, you can think uh, what is the fact, the thing that you have not seen that induced uh, what you saw. But when the, the, the mapping is nonlinear, then your mind alone can do this. So you need a formal way of doing this. And the language of mathematics is an excellent language for use in formalizing these uh, relationships, making hypotheses about what it could look like, and then actually testing this. And I saw the potential for doing this in medicine, uh, uh, understanding disease. On the, we have uh, the, one of the most complex, so the brain is arguably the most complex machine uh, in the world, but the immune system is also incredibly complex, and this determines whether we, or not we fall sick when we, we get uh, infected, for example, or whether a drug will work, or whether a vaccine will work. And so I saw um, the potential to make a bigger impact uh, from doing this kind of work, which I saw, I also noticed there were, that many people uh, doing it was very necessary rather than just going to do medicine and applying what's already out there, taking drugs and giving to people. It's a wonderful field, uh, but I think uh, because of the background I had uh, initially, the exposure I had to mathematics and the understanding of biology and uh, the, the immunology and the importance to the relationship to medicine, I believe I had the opportunity to combine these two and make an impact. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nasa, you're, I guess, then the true biologist in, in the crowd here, um, working on uh, drug delivery and materials for releasing of drugs in the body. And you were telling me that you have a family background more in the engineering sciences, exactly. but you went into to medicine. Yes, what I was inspired able to escape, you there? Yeah, I was able to escape from this engineering career, which runs in my family. 
Well, uh, what really inspired me to pursue this career is that um, before I'm a scientist, I'm a humanitarian. So I believe that people, when they are in suffering from a disease, they are in their most vulnerable condition. So if you are able to make an impact on these people in these conditions, it is going to be really great. So also I was fascinated with the drug technology and the drug discovery process and the pharmaceutical properties of material. So I said, why not combine this, the pharmaceutical sciences uh, and all the um, advances in the pharmaceutical sciences and tailor them to um, benefit medicine and to treat diseases. So this is how I chose to pursue this career. And um, from the results of my research that I'm going to show in the spotlight tomorrow, the spotlight session, um, the field that I'm pursuing, which is nanotechnology, I'm using nanoparticles for uh, delivery of drugs, especially in cancers and Alzheimer's. And um, the, the results from my research were very promising on the pharmacological level in animals. And we actually tested these nanoparticles clinically in some of the dermatological diseases, in basal cell carcinoma, in psoriasis, in skin fungal infections. And the results are just amazing. You can minimize the dose of the drug as to like 20 times less dose, and you can achieve even better efficacy than the chemical drugs without any side effects. So I can recall one of the testimonials of one of the patients who was suffering from vitiligo, and we were uh, attempting this new formulation, the nano formula, and he told me that it has been like 10 years he has been suffering from the disease, and he hasn't shown it hasn't um, he hasn't seen any progress but after using this formula this nano formula he is really thankful and he's really happy and this was really enough for me to know that I'm making an impact for the welfare of people that's enough for me uh, Klaus I noticed something on the dais right here next to me that I'm very uh, envious of it's a nice little gold shiny object. Could that be possibly uh, something you received a while ago, the Nobel? <laughs> I've not been that close. <laughs> so we were chatting a little bit about uh, that prize and, and other prizes and just the notion of prizes in science and whether are they motivating, are they inspirational, or could they be counterproductive? And you had some thoughts about the pros and cons of them, and I was wondering if you might share that. Okay, fortunately, Alfred Nobel had a very nice name. <laughs> Nobel, it sounds very good. Smith also maybe not so interesting. <laughs> so therefore, it's worldwide accepted as something very special in science. And uh, therefore, I think, to motivate young people that there's something like an Oscar in science also, but you should never work just for the Nobel Prize. The probability is too small and uh, you will be disappointed. <laughs> and if somebody says he's working for the Nobel Prize, that, that's the wrong direction. So uh, if you ask Nobel Prize winner, very often they say it was unexpected. They looked for something, and then they saw something which I couldn't understand, especially in, as an experimentalist. We have already the truth. Nature is the truth, and we always fighting with nature to understand it. And then to have the freedom to go in other direction, to ask questions, this is the most important part. So the Nobel Prize is worldwide accepted as the highest level, and if you get the prize, it can go down only. So therefore, <laughs> uh, you should not get it too early, <laughs> but enjoy it to do science, ask interesting questions, and be happy if you get this prize. <laughs> but it should not be in such a way that you feel pressure to get this prize. Mm. I see the development in some countries to have Nobel Prize winners. You have to invest long-term investment in basic science then automatically the Nobel Prizes will come. In Japan, for a long time, they were very unhappy to have no Nobel Prizes. Now they invested 30, 40 years ago a lot in basic science, and now the results are visible. And therefore, 
uh, uh, government should not say, we want to have in three years' time a Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. This will not work. And this is a wrong direction to motivate people because they will be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> Just this might be for the whole panel. Um, in terms of motivation, and I probably shouldn't say this working at a scientific journal, but there's a lot of pressure to publish. And we were talking a little bit earlier about the pressure to publish in journals and whether that is an inappropriate motivation. How do you as scientists or as directors of scientists get your colleagues to focus on important research, important questions, rather than publishable research? Because you can generate a lot of publishable units that may not be as uh, inspirational or as enabling as working on some of the difficult questions. So maybe any of you who'd like to respond. You're the director of research. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're doing science, the goal is to understand nature. So this should be the metric by which you measure the output. Have you advanced our understanding of nature? It doesn't have to be about publishing. There are lots of papers published that are minor modifications of what existed, and sometimes they are mod the modifications are not done very well, and uh, they still get published. I'll give you an example in, uh, so Neil mentioned earlier, mathematical biology. So there are many young students across Africa today studying something uh, that's called mathematical epidemiology, and what the, they think is that what they're doing is going to help us control epidemics when we do have those outbreaks. But you may notice that uh, we recently had the Ebola outbreak, and uh, where, were they, uh, where were those uh, students uh, and uh, faculty, you know, senior researchers who've published research uh, uh, over a long period of time in this mathematical epidemiology, you would, suggest, you would expect that maybe some of the theories they've come up with, some of the methods they have come up with would be applicable to that uh, situation. There are people doing mathematical epidemiology that is extremely useful, and there are people doing it in a way that is, very, that is useless. And one of the reasons is that there is a, people can enter the field and they're fascinated by the mathematics and they lose touch with reality. So we need to know what our goal is. Are we trying to do science? Are we trying to understand nature? and ensure that whatever we do actually does advance the understanding of nature. Now, there, are, there is an, another side uh, to this. So, uh, <clears throat> we, we want to understand nature, but the lessons that we've learned from people like Einstein is that often to understand nature really well at the fundamental level, we need the help of mathematics. So we study, we, get, we identify certain organizing principles, we use this as the basis for developing models and then we use these models to make new predictions, and then we test, we repeat the cycle. In the process, we're advancing our understanding of nature. Where do these models come from? Einstein had to learn new mathematics in order to, to instantiate his, his ideas, his hypotheses, so they could be tested, uh, so their deductive validity could be tested. So we need new mathematics. So the, we need people who are interested just in exploring numbers, geometry, but in ways that are consistent with, uh, with the, the logic, the, the rules of mathematics. So there also we have uh, um, ways of identifying what is use, potentially useful, useful for mathematics itself, and not for nature per se, and what is useless. So these are the, the, the ways in which we should be looking at uh, the work we do and evaluating the work we do. And it's, it's good if you're, under, you're trying to do, make a breakthrough um, in our understanding of nature to spend 10 years not uh, just thinking and, uh, and making, as long as you're thinking in, a good direct, in the right direction, that is, we need to create space for people like that to just think. Absolutely. Can I come yep, in? Go ahead, yeah. So uh, there was no pre-planned uh, arrangement between we and, me and Wilfred, but my answer is identical. Uh, it's amazing the resonance, in fact, between our approaches. That's probably why we both ended up uh, with Ames. <laughs> but, uh, so I'm director of a very big institute in Canada, the largest center in the world where people study uh, foundational theoretical physics. And uh, what I tell my faculty is exactly that. 
that the be all and end all of our field is to describe nature. Um, and exactly as Wilfred says, often that is a, that's such a difficult path and it involves inventing new types of mathematics and it's a very long-term process. But what I tell my faculty is that uh, I don't care about publishing. Uh, that's not the objective. If you're doing uh, brilliant science, you have to, the word I introduced when I became director was breakthrough. We're here to make breakthroughs. We're not here to publish, we're not here to do normal science, we're not here to hold conferences, excuse me for this conference. <laughs> we're not here to drink coffee, we're here to make real discoveries about nature. So that's very scary, and when I said that to my faculty, they all, oop, you know, uh, because people typically say Einstein was lucky, uh, Newton, Maxwell, Dirac, there are all these people who made real breakthrough discoveries about the laws of nature. And I say that's what we're after. We're after discoveries at that level. We can never lower our sights. Now, frankly, most people who do theoretical physics in the world today are exploring all kinds of models, very complicated models. There's grand unified models and string theory and supersymmetry, extra dimensions, there's a multiverse. None of these models has any track record of successful description of nature. At the best, they can be described as explorations which may one day lead closer. But the way in which they're done is not in terms of finding the deductive principles or foundational mathematical principles. They're typically done as a self-serving enterprise where thousands of researchers write tens of thousands of papers every year and hold lots of conferences. So I'm very critical of my own field. Um, and it's quite sad because this field is, in my view, one of the most surprising and spectacular in all of science. So when this field gets confused and starts, frankly, uh, running after popularity or citations or all of these, uh, you know, superficial measures of science, it's very bad for the rest of science. So uh, we'll be discussing this, I guess, on Wednesday. There's another panel on the future of physics. And um, I think all of us as scientists need to be very self-critical of ourselves, of our fields, and see that most of what passes in the name of science is not, uh, you know, doesn't live up to what science should be. Dr. Nasser, you, you also direct a, a small group, and could you tell me what you tell your colleagues, maybe starting out in the career, or, or even at the same level, what lessons have you learned, and anything in particular, I guess, for the women researchers who may be trying to break into a new field? Okay, so um, I'm currently leading a group of researchers, both males and females. And I believe that, uh, of course, as a leader of a research group, you have to communicate your knowledge in a good way to those researchers so that they can become like leaders themselves. So for this, you have to lead by example. You have to set a good example for these scientists so that they can follow on your footsteps. But especially regarding female scientists, I believe that we're facing so much challenges in terms of uh, for example, stereotyping, for example, when you're trying to apply for a position or for a scholarship, there is, even if in the application it says that it's open for both sexes, I really believe that deep inside, they really hope that the applicant is a male scientist. And this is really a problem because um, the perception that a female scientist has, of course we have obligations towards our family, raising family and keeping everything going, that's okay, but we are also capable of doing multidisciplinary and multitasking stuff. So we can excel at home, we can excel at work, we can do several stuff. So really my message for the female scientists here in the room and uh, out there, that even if there are challenges, just be patient. We are going to rule the world. So just be patient. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask one more question generally for the panel and then look to the audience for a few questions, hopefully, um, because I know we're running past our time and 
I'll get the nod from the organizers pretty soon. Um, as I've covered science over the years and I've heard tales of discovery, what's always impressed me has been the number of failures leading up to that discovery. And one of the reasons I didn't stay in science was I liked immediate gratification of journalism, uh, <laughs> publishing a story this week or next week, as opposed to spending years on a question and maybe not getting the right answer. So can you, maybe all of you, tell the audience, how do you stick in there on a topic? What, you know, what lessons or what tricks of the trade do you use to keep motivated when a lot of science is failure? Okay, for an experimentalist, it's very easy because I learn always on a failure. So if something is not working, so I have to reorganize my thinking. So if it's three times not working, then I know I'm not on the right track. So I see it more positive to learn something. Mm. Therefore, 90% uh, is not as what you expected. But you have to answer the question from the other direction. And each failure, is, for me, is learning. Mm. Therefore, you should see this positive. Mm. Uh, and, and life is not easy. You are not always successful <laughs> in, the, in the right direction. Therefore, uh, for a statistician, okay, you have to learn the starting point was not correct if you cannot confirm it finally. Right. Uh, so there's always a fighting what is the truth, and we are never sure that we have the truth. We are just looking whether it's in agreement what we see in nature. Right. So uh, I think this is a normal way of your daily life, mm. and if somebody cannot work with these failures, then he has trouble. I see it positive. Yeah. yeah, so to, to be honest, I mean, my whole career is a uh, litany of failures. <laughs> when you work in uh, unified field theories and testing them against observations, uh, almost everything is a failure and has been for the last 30 years. I and mean, the standard model of, uh, of particle physics is astonishingly successful. And, you know, they built a 10 billion euro machine, the Large Hadron Collider, it just confirmed the Higgs boson and nothing else. And, uh, you know, 90% of theorists or more working in this field were very disappointed because all <laughs> the models they had worked on were disproved. Uh, that's normal in our field. Uh, what keeps me going, I mean, occasionally you're lucky and you calculate something which agrees with nature. And that's, that's both really amazing, but it's also profoundly disappointing if the rules you used were in place before. You didn't change the rules, you simply turned the crank and got a result and it agrees. So I was very fortunate to do this, predicting the polarization of the microwave background from the Big Bang. No one had calculated it before, we calculated it, they did the experiment, it agrees beautifully. And actually we haven't learned anything. <laughs> we just learned that our predecessors were very smart <laughs> okay? and uh, just waited some time and we, we could turn the cal do the calculation. But what keeps me going is the thought of what a privilege it is even to be able to think about these things. Uh, so I find that totally remarkable, that one can sit there and think meaningfully and build on these amazing theories of the past and contemplate issues as remote as the Big Bang itself. What happened at the Big Bang? And you can get somewhere. I mean, you get to some picture or model or uh, understanding, and then you can either test it mathematically, does it make sense, are there contradictions? And usually most theories fail on those grounds. Or if you're very lucky, you can get to propose measurements which it can be tested. So it's an amazing way to spend your life worrying about the frontiers of science. Uh, it feels an extraordinary privilege, and I think uh, my big passion is to share that opportunity with as many people as possible, especially in Africa. Because I think when African, Africans enter science in large numbers with their diversity, with their very different backgrounds, perspectives, and above all, their extreme levels of motivation, they're going to make uh, massive discoveries and transformative, and they're just waiting there to be made. Thank you. Unless either of you two have 
Would you like to answer? Okay. Yeah, so in line with what uh, Neil said, so there's a lot of excitement in the exploration, in the anticipation of a result, and much of that actually dies down after the result is found. So there's actually a cost to being successful, <laughs> which is often a concern. Loss of motiv motivation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. May I also add that um, one thing to keep you motivated is that you can keep motivating others. Because if you like surround yourself with several happy people, motivated people, <laughs> then happiness is contagious. So even right. if you are suffering challenges yourself, Correct. it's going to be easy if you're surrounding yourself with positive environment. Correct. In fact, I have to report, I had a lovely experience just catching the plane from Canada to Rwanda. So I have an amazing group of students who work with me at Perimeter, and we were studying quantum tunneling, and it's a fascinating phenomenon. And so I got off the plane in Amsterdam, and I'm all jet-lagged and everything, and they sent me a picture. We finally got this to work, <laughs> okay? And I was like, whoa! <laughs> and it required ingenuity and playfulness, and they did things I hadn't thought of doing. And that's, that's the wonder of doing science among several people. You know, when you isolate it, the theorist always tends to imagine I'm going to sit in a corner and solve everything. It doesn't work like that. Okay, it, a lot of theoretical discoveries are accidental um, and having people to bounce ideas off and especially young people who are not, who play uh, is, is really incredibly stimulating yeah. and motivating. Yeah. I, I think one lesson from that is having a network of colleagues and collaborators is part of the, the, the foundation of science as an inspiration. So, given that and the amount of time, maybe I would ask for questions from the audience to join us in this conversation. Is there, a, I see one back there, if we could start over on that side. I think there's a mic. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jean Lubouma. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Sciences at the University of Pretoria. Um, I have a two, I would like to ask two questions. Uh, the first one is uh, if the, the panel could share with us how one would motivate young Africans to do mathematics, to do science. Because uh, for example, from South Africa where uh, I am based, it is very difficult to convince young people to do mathematics, to do science, because there is no future according to them. And according also to their parents, there is no future with mathematics. So if, uh, and I think that this is a serious problem in the whole continent. That's the first question. The second one. Um, it is about uh, this uh, link between thinking, thinking about a research question, about a scientific question, and publication. I think that there is a need of uh, some balance in thinking and publication because if you keep thinking without any publication after, I don't know how many years, you will be fired. <laughs> we, we know how, how, universi how our university, how the system works. Even in Europe, the expression comes, from, by the way, from America, publish or perish. Right. So if we just say, think, take time thinking, then you will never be promoted. Then, then you will eventually be fired. So I think that there is a need of balance there. And in fact, generally what the university requests from uh, researchers, from academic, is to publish quality research. It is not just publish. So I would like to have some comment from uh, the panel about these issues. Thank you. Okay. So, 
I may answer the first part of the question, which is about motivating uh, young scientists to pursue science and uh, careers in mathematics. Well, I was a uh, member of the Africa Science Leadership Program, and following this program, I was really inspired to make a change, particularly in this aspect. Uh, me and other groups of colleagues, we managed to make uh, capacity building uh, workshops for scientists in, um, in Egypt, in several faculties. We were doing workshops just to show them that really a career in science can be rewarding, can be motivating, and don't be afraid to pursue such a career. So I believe that part of our roles as scientists is that we need to motivate others and to uh, specifically focus on those young scientists to explain the merits and the challenges that we're facing and to be honest about that. So part of our responsibility is actually to do more of these workshops and to do more of these projects. So I believe that if any of us can do this, even in his own institution or in the, institute, in the neighboring institutions, this is going to be really something really nice. Um, yeah, on this question of how to encourage uh, young Africans to do science, I think uh, one, one needs to start from a recognition of how destructive uh, education can be and has been uh, in Africa in uh, many environments. So South Africa is a special case because of apartheid, and there was a conscious uh, process whereby the regime told black people, you're not able to do intellectual things. You're just for labor, and uh, you should, so they deliberately uh, discouraged or prevented uh, black students from doing engineering or physics or maths, anything technical. Um, and uh, I think that has had long, long-term effects. Uh, in other countries, I think of Cameroon, for example, Wilford country, uh, there seems to be no problem in finding lots of young people who want to do maths at a very advanced level in certain regions. It's regional, by the way. It's cultural. A tradition develops in certain communities that this is really cool to be good at maths. And those regions produce most of the mathematically inclined uh, students. So it's cultural. Uh, it runs very, very deep uh, within our psyche. Uh, you know, I can say in my own case, I talk personally. Um, I, of course, grew up in a white family. I was very privileged in South Africa. But both of my parents went to prison. Um, they were in that movie which Ray Weiss uh, showed. They both went to prison. This was the best thing for my scientific career. <laughs> uh, they both went to prison. They came out. We, our family was harassed by the police and we lived a very difficult life, and then we were refugees for several years. Uh, and what I noticed is that they never lost hope. On the contrary, they took pride in combating uh, injustice. And it's who they were, it's who defined them. And so when I came to study science and maths, this was terrific for me, because I never accepted anything anyone would tell me. Uh, I had no problem in saying, you're wrong, I think you're wrong, there's a better way to do it. And uh, I'm still like that today. <laughs> okay. And it is very important to realize your source of strength as a scientist comes from who you are. So think of all the hardships you've had to go through in order to complete your studies or, uh, or, or live your life and draw strength from those hardships. It makes you who you are, and it gives you a huge advantage. If you, if you realize, having overcome that, I can do much more. And, so, and when you think of young Africans, they endure more hardship than youth from anywhere else in the world, probably. Many of them come through. The people we get coming to Ames have extraordinary life histories, every one of them. And when you see them succeeding, as we now do, at very high levels, I've met so many at this forum who are succeeding at remarkably high levels. Um, it's, uh, it tells you they are drawing strength from their disadvantage. And that's very profound. 
right there, the lady back there. The lady in blue there, please. Hi everyone, my name is Lovet, and um, I will have to, I want to say a suggestion or a comment to what the man behind said. If you want to encourage STEM, STEM for young people, I think project-based learning from a young age is a way to improve that. If we should incorporate project-based learning in our studies in school, from primary schools to secondary schools, they will not have problem going to the university pursuing STEM careers. I think that's um, what I want to say. <clears throat> Can I make a, a, state, a comment? Sure. Just, just briefly. So and we'll take I think one it's, more question. It's good to that. make the distinction between a scientist, or what you can call a lay scientist, and a professional scientist. Science tells us that we are all scientists. Even kids are scientists. Science is fundamentally about making observations, developing hypotheses to explain what we observe, and conducting experiments. And kids do this all the time. So I think we need to learn, first of all, understand that our kids are all scientists, and then learn to identify the kinds of things that they do in fundamentally scientific ways and try to encourage them in that direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's a brief comment I want to make. That's so I think we'll take one more um, gentleman on the right side there. I apologize, but I think we'll have to cut it off after this according to the organizers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Jonathan Do, uh, NEA fellow from Togo. The reason why you don't have young people uh, succeeding in science, technology, etc., it's right in front of you. We are not there. <laughs> so what, what I wanted to say is that, we w I mean, the, the topic is about uh, inspiring young people. We want, we would like to see people who doesn't hold, I mean, the title, who are not directors, who are not professors. Let's think about Mark Zuckerberg, Steve Jobs, even Einstein. He was dropped out of school. We need to have sometimes some examples of people who made it without the box. That's the reason why you don't have young people. Thank you very much. Can I, can I, can I just respond quickly to that? <laughs> I want to respond quickly. Uh, Raymond Weiss, Raina Weiss, who you saw in the video, he never did undergraduate degree. By the way, he's absolutely unusual. He was employed at MIT as a lab technician. That's all. And then he turned out to be more clever in the lab than the professors. <laughs> well, I think that's a, a fair point and a great point to end on. Um, Neil actually earlier had talked about Einstein doing much of his groundbreaking work outside of the system before he became celebrated, became, before he was a, uh, um, a well-known university professor in that sense. And so I think, uh, although we have a celebrated panel of directors here, that shouldn't in no way um, discourage anyone who doesn't have the director title from thinking that they can win that next Nobel Prize and make a video like Ray Weiss or do something perhaps not Nobel worthy but that might change um, lives on this continent. So thank you very much and enjoy your evening and the dinners and networking that's gonna go on the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.